And welcome everybody to a, uh, a panel discussion on the future of corporate learning. And uh, we're really excited about the group that we have here this morning. We will pop every all of our panelists LinkedIn profiles into the chat here very shortly. Uh, but as we start every uh, event, every meeting here at SAIT, we're going to do a quick land recognition. And for that, I'm going to turn you over to Jenny Gilbert, who many of you on the line may know, and if not, Jenny is one of our fantastic uh, leadership uh, business skill uh, facilitators here at SAIT. And uh, I've been working closely with Jenny through the last couple of uh, years on some uh, leadership development programming. So Jenny, uh, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. As Craig said, this is important to us at the start of every event with SAIT, and SAIT acknowledges that it's situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Today, that encompasses our Indigenous people of the Treaty 7 region, the Bikane, the Siksika, the Kaine, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda, as well as the Northwest Métis homeland. SAIT also acknowledges all the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. <clears throat> we know from the chat that you are here from all across Alberta, across Canada, and even down into the States. So thank you for taking just a moment with us to connect to the land where you are today. Perfect. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, um, with that, I'm going to quickly do some introductions and then just uh, give you a little bit of logistics as to how this morning is going to run. But in no specific order, uh, very quickly, we have Paula Blackmore-White, Manager of People and Development at Benevity. Uh, we have Nikki Montford, and I have to actually make my screen a little bigger here now, Nikki, to read the title of Acting Senior Manager of Organizational Effectiveness and Learning Services at Synovus. Amber Reimer, who is the Regional Market Lead for Deloitte Greenhouse Labs, and uh, just recently made that move from WestJet, so really exciting. Congratulations, Amber. Uh, Shane Anderson, the Director of Global Talent and Organizational Development at Stantec. And last but certainly not least, Kathy Osterlin, the Director of Learning and Development at Wajax. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm really excited about the diversity of this panel, the, uh, the varied industries we have represented here, the great backgrounds that you all bring. Uh, just for uh, some logistics, in the chat, we're going to go through some, some questions here, um, and everybody on the panel is going to have a chance to, to weigh in. Jenny's going to pop the, the actual questions that we're asking into the chat. Feel free to share your thoughts as we go through here. If you have specific questions that you would like to pose to the panel, please try very hard to utilize the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. If you find the chat, it's two spaces to the left is the Q&A button. So, um, and then when we get to the end of the conversation, we'll have some time to try and address some of the questions that you have raised this morning. So with that, um, we wanna talk about the future of corporate learning, uh, but I don't think we can do that until we kind of take a breath uh, look backwards and say, where have we been? Because the last couple of years has been, um, as we know, an incredible challenge for many of us. And I think what I would love to hear from each of you, um, first of all, is, you know, how has the last couple of years changed corporate learning in your organization? What challenges have you had to overcome? How have you had to overcome them? And I'm going to start just simply based on the order I see in my screen clockwise. And so, Nikki, you're up first here. Let's talk about the challenges of the last couple of years. Well, it has had those, but I think it's also been super exciting. I mean, we were kind of, you know, forced into, you know, all of a sudden one day, it's like you're working from home and you already have all your programs planned, all your employee development plan, leadership development. And so, you know, it was a really, uh, it was an opportunity to pivot, but it was a forced pivot. So, which has its pros and its cons. You know, you have to, we did end up having, um, I transitioned between a couple of different roles during the pandemic and, and in multiple organizations, they, you know, we really did have to, on the fly, move to virtual, everybody had to jump on board. But what it really taught us very quickly is that we can actually do anything we want virtually. Doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. Doesn't mean it's the most effective way. But it really, it forced us to embrace the technology and online learning for employee development that I think those of us in L&D have been fighting for for years, right? Trying to get organizations to move forward and get out of that classroom mode. And so, 
Yeah, it absolutely had some big challenges, but it really brought, like I said, huge opportunity for us to actually look at leveraging the technology and getting the buy-in really quickly from senior leadership down on how we can keep things moving and developing our employees. So did it change how we're doing things? Yes. And it's changing how we're looking forward now as we start to plan based on all of our lessons learned. But that's the one part of the last couple of years that I, from a learning perspective, I've thoroughly appreciated and enjoyed. Excellent. Um, it's interesting to, we'll come back to the learning formats. I love the comment about, you know, being forced to do virtually and is that right for everything, whether it can right. be or not, but Kathy, um, pop to you now, what, you know, what's the last couple of years meant for you? Yeah, I, I, I very much agree with Nikki on this. Um, yeah, we, we've really had to pivot. And I think a lot of companies that had technology in place already, like, let's say like Microsoft Teams or something like that. Uh, we're probably a bit of a step ahead because they were ready to go virtual online um, and and have individuals remote. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's definitely been exciting because a lot of the things like Nikki was mentioning um, that you know a lot of the initiatives that you had or yeah, in person training that you had scheduled for let's say leadership or anything like that, all of that had to pivot. And so what what things did you have or what initiatives did you have that could uh, be effective online versus um, you know in person where some of the programs that we had we we couldn't we just had to delay because the effectiveness wouldn't be there in a virtual environment um, but there were other things that we were able to shift and modify so that we could still do it uh, online so um, yeah definitely it was a lot of uh, <laughs> a huge pivot a forced pivot and uh, like Nikki mentioned and uh, it was exciting though. It was, it was good to be able to like build new things and, and troubleshoot and try to figure things out on how you continue to move forward. Yeah. I was, I was going to, uh, I should have started off by saying we weren't allowed to use the word pivot anymore now that we're in 2022, because <laughs> I think we've already hit about 12 or 15 pivots, but that's okay. Uh, Paula, uh, I'm going to jump to you. What, what are your thoughts you know, in the last couple of years, biggest challenges you've had to overcome? How has this all changed everything? I think that uh, what Nikki said really resonated in terms of moving folks away from that idea of like classroom or kind of event based learning where you know you go and you do a thing. Um, I think that was a really exciting opportunity. What for sure we struggled with and probably because we're a high growth company is um, onboarding. Right. So it's like it's what it's one thing when you are you are live, you come into the office, you meet some new people and you have that person, you know, you can be like, hey, Kathy, you know, like, how do I do this thing? And like Kathy's is right beside you and it's like super easy. Um, it gets difficult when you're by yourself in your home office, whatever that home office looks like to know who to reach out to. And so I think that one of the things that was a challenge was developing the discipline around knowledge management and leaving those breadcrumbs for the future newbies that come in and things like that. Um, but on the flip side, I think it also made things way more equitable. Uh, when I think back, we're a Calgary-based company, you know, uh, anybody who was based in our other offices would for sure tell you, you know, oh yeah, I would often have to do learning over my lunchtime or I'd have to do it, you know, really like late or really early or something like that. And so that, that ability to make things more equitable and to take on more of that global perspective because you're not necessarily focused, you know, um, in your actual geographic location. So I think there's pros and cons. Yeah, you, the, the who to reach out to, right? It makes me think a lot about the whole concept that, of socialization. I think that we've all really struggled with, at least personally for me over the last six months of, of this, I finally had enough, right? But when you start thinking about just the socialization aspect that learning events can bring when you're bringing teams together and how you know that's gone away and how do we overcome that? going forward. Um, Amber, you might have some interesting perspective here, kind of straddling two organizations between the time that I asked you to participate on this panel and now that you're here. So, you know, let's, let's touch on that. Absolutely. Well, we, I work, I used to work for an airline and uh, WestJet Airlines specifically, and they were, to, we were tremendously impacted. Um, I just think of the contrast between what life felt like at WestJet on March 1st of 2020 versus April 1st of 2020. We went from embarking on what was going to be one of our most bold years in the company's history, big ambitions. Um, and, you know, we started to watch some shifts in the market and numbers. And then suddenly we had to, I'm not going to, I'm going to use the word pivot. I don't even know if that uh, is the right word. It's not a big enough word uh, to going from, a, a, you know, a large, vibrant 
uh, culture-led org to how do we take that culture and work together to really protect um, the airline. Uh, and so anything related to what my portfolio was, onboarding, um, welcome to WestJet, leadership development, those things had to have an abrupt pause because we needed to have all hands on deck to ensure the survival of the airline knowing how volatile things were going to be. And like many other orgs, we're like, okay, move the milestone down the, down the lane. Things will get better. Things will shift and adapt. But is, uh, though we had to put on pause any of our sort of progressive intentions uh, when it came to leadership, what really was amazing to me was the level of rally amongst West Jetters. Um, obviously, we switched to essential training only some of that training, if you're going to be a flight attendant, a cabin crew member, you need to be in person. And so we had to really rethink health and safety. Um, safety has always been a primary element of WestJet's culture, but I am exceptionally proud of how seriously we took it and all those elements. What shifted, especially in our leadership development space, was almost like, how do we stay in a pack virtually together to to keep up with the waves and changes. And so what emerged is almost like an emergency meeting became a really um, fertile ground for engaging our leadership community. So like the other um, panelists have shared, there's this sort of, um, there's a gift in everything. And I think those are the things that have stayed through. Mm -hmm. And now as I onboard in a new organization where I had come from a place where I knew everybody in the coffee line, Shane and I used to stand in that coffee line together uh, in this marvelous physical space, right? Learning and training and work was a physical space before. I'm logging into what is basically a very similar laptop using my same keyboard. Now I work for a different company. And so that's been really interesting. I've been really thinking of it from the learner or the user experience and how do we create culture in this time of dramatic change? So those are the things that are on my mind um, based on those two you know, very different experiences over the last couple of years as we navigate this uncertainty. Yeah, I, what you touched on there, I can just imagine what it was like for all the West Jetters, and I see you're getting some love from uh, West Jetters in the in the chat, so that's great. But you know, you went from this very dynamic, um, coming off the excitement, at least for us, a couple of years ago, working with West Jet on the Dreamliner launch, and I think you hit on it there to this very all of a sudden survival mode, right? Like what a what a like, just a snap effect to try and work through that. So, um, Shane, last but not least on this question, let's talk yeah. about your challenges of the last couple of years. Sure. Um, and and Jody, uh, a former colleague of mine, also has, has sort of preempted what I was thinking as I was listening to those responses because, you know, as we imagine the world shifting. Um, in, in, I also went through, was at one organization, try, did a, a whole app merger acquisition activity all while working remotely, and then started a new organization and have worked there all remotely. And one of the things that is really interesting is the, the pocketing effect that we already knew happened in organizations still was happening. It's just become more pronounced because for teams who figured out very quickly or leaders and groups figured out very quickly, hey, I got to do more frequent, I have to be more intentional. I have to do more frequent check-ins with my team. I have to bring us together for that virtual coffee that Amber talked about. So maybe we don't stand in the line and maybe it's made in my own machine in my kitchen. Um, but we still need to have that time that is not objective-based. It's not, we have to accomplish this thing in this conversation, that emergent piece of it, right? And so for some of us, we got our Christmas wish and with every gift comes something, right? And And we got leaders that were engaging with their teams much more regularly, much more intentionally, because you had to set that one-on-one -on -one because of working remotely versus, uh, you know, folks in the chat have been mentioning, like when we were in a physical space, those collisions, those I just have time with you, that oral tradition was enough to sustain us. So we have areas of the organization that are super connected with their leaders and they're learning from each other. And some of that is going on outside of the, call it corporate learning purview. I mean, most of us in this conversation, we have a a remit or a mandate to look after some element of corporate learning at an organization. And for me, what that really shifted, the challenge was all of a sudden I had to become okay with, not all of this is in my hands anymore. I am not the master curator of all the corporate learning that's gonna go on here. It's going to be happening in a much more dynamic way. We always wished for this. This is the key, like we all wanted this. We said, oh, leaders should be more actively engaged and, People should be doing more of this. That's not just formal training, sorry, Greg. Uh, you know, but it should be all those things. And we got that. 
And then our pirouette that I love that way of, of reclaiming that terminology was to go, okay, how do I, as a practitioner now, and as a group within the organization that is charged with um, a certain level of things that we need to accomplish or that we're being measured on or that the organization requires, how do we live into that? How do we live into a world where things are happening outside of our reach and that we can't necessarily measure them as easily or capture them as easily or share them as easily, but maybe that's okay. And, and that for me, the big challenge was as practitioners to go, okay, hang on, I got the thing I wanted. Now what do I do with that? And how do I operate in a new world? And so it took a mental shift from us, not only just in the, the physicality of where people were located or the use of technology. I love Sarah was talking about simulations using technology versus physical equipment. I think that we all kind of get we're super excited about those things. But in my mind, it was this very more mundane shift that started to happen. And then by contrast, the other end of the spectrum were people who were never seeing their leader or never having those conversations with their team and started to feel like the ice flow that had broken off and was drifting further and further away from their team in the organization. So I think we saw a, a bunch of that stuff happen. And so for us, it was a bit of the okay, wait a second, we've got everything from over here and over here, how do we help support all of that in a really effective way? Yeah, I, what I find interesting there, your comment about intentionality and then potentially going forward, how you combine that with uh, giving up control and needing to focus on what truly is important, what's meeting your objectives versus saying that, to your point, you know, I used to control it all, right? Um, but so when we talk about how learning and development can be intentional, and Paul, I'm going to come to you on this one. Uh, when we think about what so many organizations are going through right now, this great resignation, reshuffle, rethinking, right? Um, how can we be intentional in the role that you know, corporate learning plays in recruitment and retention? Like where, where does that fit into this going forward? Yeah, I think that uh, I had a great analogy that I heard a few years ago, and it's like when when many of us started our learning careers, it was kind of like that TV guide model, right? It's like you, you know, we showed this we showed this class at this time on this date, and you know, tune into that class kind of thing. And you know, probably up until about maybe five, you know, even two years ago, we were moving into that Netflix model. You know, many of us had got LMSs now, where you know you could your learners could find things on demand. Um, and, you know, if you had the really fancy MLMS, it was actually recommended to them, you know, kind of like the Netflix algorithm. But, you know, if we're if we're really being honest nowadays, like we're in the YouTube or even like the TikTok like version of learning now, right? Our, like our learners go out and they find, think about the last time that you Googled your own job, right? It's like, you know, it's it's not, you know, I made this joke in, in the panel and I, I'm sorry if I break anybody's hearts, but, you know, like when was the last time when you needed to know something in your job where you're just like, hmm, I should go to the LMS, right? It's like, it doesn't really happen. Like we go to Google um, or we go to our teammates or, you know, when we were physically in the office, we would turn and be like, hey, how do you do this? And so I think that learning's role is really, um, I love what Shane said about giving up control, but it's, we never really, I think we had the illusion of control, you know, and at best we probably control maybe 10% of what our people learn. Our people are learning everything all the time in all manners of ways. Um, and so, you know, letting go of that idea of like, this is exactly how you set goals, or this is exactly how you have the specific one-to-one -one conversation, because really you can go onto Google and find a million ways to have that one-to-one -one conversation. And instead it's, I think the idea now is, teaching our people how to be learning agile. And there's gonna be jobs that exist in five years and 10 years and 20 years that don't, we don't even have a job title for. We don't even know what they are. And so people are going to have to do all of those buzzwords. They're gonna to have to upskill and reskill and all of that jazz. And so teaching people how to learn and to realize that learning is not an event-based thing. You know, I think Jody put in the chat, it's like that idea of like, 70% of our learning is happening on the job. And so how do we get our leaders better at teaching their people? But how do we get our own people to, to, to be better teachers to each other? So I think that the idea around learning agility is really where we can actually add a lot of value and will really help in terms of keeping people engaged. But also, you know, I think about things, you know, our job is to actually equip people to go be amazing in regardless where they are. Yes, we want them to stay within our organization, but really it's like, you know, we have a concept of benevity called acts of good and then acts of like an act of good for somebody who is an L&D is to make sure that people actually know how to learn wherever they go in their mm -hmm. careers. Yeah, I like I like that a lot. Any who else want anybody else want to weigh in on this? 
think that thank you for that, Paula. There's there's a lot in there, and I see the chat is all over this as well. So I'm trying very hard to keep 90% of my focus here on the on the ears, but I see the odd great comment coming through here. But other thoughts from this group on I saw Nikki waving. I think Kathy, I see you come off mute. So Nikki and then Kathy. Yeah, I, I love what you said, Paula, around, you know, that we're learning on the job all the time. And it's interesting when you, you know, we talk about the great resignation and even, you know, I've seen some reports on, you know, what people are looking for, right, as they're resigning, what are some of the main reasons they're leaving other than, you know, wanting more flexibility and some of the things that have come out during, you know, the last couple of years. But one of the key things that tends to pop out all the time is I wish there was more employee development and it's shifting our organizations because there always is like you said 70% of our learning is actually on the job it's not the formal classroom pieces and I think we need to shift how we're communicating that and how we're creating those learning ecosystems or learning organizations because when we're looking at retention there's opportunity all the time but it, employees also need to understand you know you've got to be intentional I'm going to learn this but leaders also need to step into that space as well and I think we need to to start giving that 70% more credit. Those absolutely, those, you know, um, programs, leadership, employee development, like formalized programs are really, really important. But that 70% is, if not more so important, because it's always ongoing. And I feel like that's a gap that we're not pulling in on, um, where it could, it's, you know, it's right there in front of us. And uh, something that I think can actually increase our retention without having to go down the route of formal training. Mm -hmm. yeah, very good. Really good. Kathy? Yeah, I, I definitely, Nikki, you hit on that at the end there where, where you talked about, um, you know, we, we may not have to go down that formal training because like 70% is on the job, right? And, um, and I think the real struggle right now for a lot of companies is they don't have enough people to do work. So they don't have enough time to train, right? And that's been a, quite a huge struggle, I've, you know. For, for the company I work for, as well as other companies or colleagues that I have, right? And so how, how do we then, um, you know, how do we then try to make some type of training program or get buy-in to be able to, to have that time with the individuals to make sure that they do get trained on certain things? So that's, uh, that's, something, that's something that we're trying to deal with now. I'm sure a lot of companies are. Yeah. Amber? Um, what I find really fascinating, you know, as we do the look back, it's so important to what Nikki was saying about punctuating the 70% on the job that we have developed capabilities in our organizations in the last years in, in ways we never could have imagined. Like everyone out there, give yourself a good job, me, because you have built resiliency, um, speed to market. Uh, agile decision making. So those are things that we would have said in 2019, late 2019, what kind of capabilities do we want to grow in our org? That would have been in our top five. Well, not that we asked for it, but we sure got it, right? And I, so I think it's really important as learning professionals to remind people that they're learning in the flow of work every day uh, with uh, which the, uh, the the knowledge or the, the desire to, okay, what is that next capability I'm going to pursue or collect? And that you're really uh, serving the direction of your organization with those really big meaty skills that maybe historically we put in a classroom, in a webinar, um, and then we closed that off and went back to our job, right? So how are we using these new capabilities we've acquired and being really vocal about them? So just a curiosity and an invitation to all those orgs out there. Yeah, it's, there's a comment that's come up here that I think I want to kind of go off our pre-plan just to, to address this a little bit is that you know, people want people want formal training, not just on the job. There's more value from formal recognized training thoughts. And I, I say this, you know, fully and Shane, you touched on this earlier. Again, we talk, we're talking today about the future of corporate learning, not the future of corporate training. So it can help you with that training piece, yes, but this is about corporate learning. So let's kind of dive into that a little bit around the, the difference between learning and formal training and where the formal training perhaps makes sense going forward. Well, Shane, I see you're off mute. I'll come to you first. Yeah, then, I, I think it's, I think this is where it gets to be one of those ecosystem questions, Greg, right? Like it, you know, if you want to have that recognition of things that are outside of just formal training, you also have to have a view to how do I tie it to something, which means a good development plan, or at very least a good conversation around where is it you want to get to? What are the kinds of things you want to do in the future? And so if you have that, then, you know, if you have that good conversation and maybe you actually write it down into a development plan where you can then say, okay, I went and I worked with Nikki and I, I mean, I actually have done this in life, worked with Nikki, learned tons 
about how to do this thing and have brought it back into my work, at least if I have a development plan, I can check mark it and so have some kind of recognition, if you will. And, and recognition, I think sometimes we get into that um, tension between individuals and organizations where in some organizations it's, oh, I either have an expectation or I've got PD that I have to do for a credential or I have, like there's all these reasons why I need to have something that's official, right? And formal training is often a proxy for it's officially recognized, right? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, this is where if you've at least got those kind of preceding steps, and oftentimes because we in organizations and a lot of leaders don't spend the time, effort, energy, because we as organizations don't help them prioritize that. We don't measure them enough on it. We, we want them to create the widgets. Yeah, if you manage your people well, great. You know, I was just watching the Simon Sinek thing about working with the Navy SEALs and he talks about, you know, performance versus trust, right? And people in that organization, which is sort of considered sort of the best of the best, would rather have a medium to low performing but high trust individual over the high performing low trust individual. But we often reward, recognize, promote people who produce lots of stuff, right? And who make it happen. And that's, that's got relevance. Like I'm not saying it, it wasn't a thing that you should do, but it has its impacts, right? And so if we can switch that a little bit, reprioritize to how are you having those intentional conversations with your folks? How are you making sure there's some clarity for them on if they want to aspire to whatever it might be, what are the things that they likely need to do, at least in your view, you're never going to get it 100%, but what could they do to help develop towards that? Then at least if they are doing on-the-job training or mentorship or coaching or whatever it is, all these other methodologies that we have and love, that's how they can get some of that credit for it and it seems more official. Yeah. Nikki, you're off mute, I see. I'm always off mute, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> have something to say no um i complete i agree with what exactly what shane is saying and i think that's where sometimes you know we run into the challenge too is because i mean truly we're developing people with the hopes that they're going to stay within our organization right and we're succession planning from like early parts of their career which is where some of that on the job training comes in but the reality is is that formalized training is something like it's got an accreditation or a title or something is that's what they can put on a resume or put on a profile and take with them and i think that's where some Sometimes the challenge comes in is that if I can say I've completed the certificate, even if it's within house, I've done a leadership program at XYZ company, I can put that on there and everybody will recognize it regardless of the content regardless of what i've taken it's a stamp or a visible view and i think that's where sometimes we really struggle as organizations is that sometimes feels like the only validity which to me means we're actually dropping the ball within the company um you know if you feel like you need to have that formalized training then what are, what are we not doing that's creating that culture where people are super excited to learn on the job and are actually finding a way to make that recognizable? Because it doesn't always have to be us, if that makes any sense. I don't know what everyone else has to think. Yeah. Paula, I see your hand. Yeah, I totally agree with that, um, Nikki. And I think that uh, I think sometimes in the absence of knowing what somebody really wants, we assume it's that formal training and they themselves assume right it's like hey like i've seen you know i've i've, I've heard that somebody was sent on this like course and it was like three thousand dollars i'm like that's 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 value to me i i should go on this course as well and you know if you can really pull you know at, like get underneath them to the like to that thing it's not just a symptom like what's the root cause there is it that they're craving you know mobility in their job is it that they want to acquire a skill um, is it that they, you know, that they have that monetary kind of, you know, association to being valued with something like that? And then being able to pull on that thread, because I think sometimes folks don't always realize that that's one of the reasons they put such value on those formal training events. And I think as an organization, if we can get a little bit more clear and help our leaders get more clear and have those conversations, um, when we use those formal events, you will be using at a higher value because ROI, like, is, is something we're all chasing. And so we'll be able to get better, um, better ROI because people will be getting what they want and what they need. Yeah, excellent. Kathy, did you want to weigh in on this one too? And then Amber, I'm going to come to you on this ROI question after this. All my points get hit by everybody else. It's perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I, what I was thinking about as well was for, for the formal training, really need to make sure that whatever we're putting in place makes sense to the top everybody in the business, right? 
there's a lot of times that I see that uh, programs get put in place because at the higher level, they look great. And then when it gets down to your frontline employees, they're like, like, I, I don't see the value in this, right? So, so really kind of like, you know, it's, um, it's, it's case by case basis. It's, um, you know, trial and error type thing sometimes running pilots to see whether or not it makes sense. And if there's really value to the people that you really want to get the value out of it, right? Great point, for sure. So Amber, you can certainly carry on on this one too, but I also want to get your thoughts on the whole concept of ROI on learning or perhaps the cost of inaction on learning. I'd say on the other side of it there. So anyway, I'll, I kind of throw that to you to follow up on this, but then really, how do we look at defining the ROI on learning? Uh, for sure, and Kathy was touching on, you know, this, let's say you, you're launching a big learning initiative, really get clear on who your audience is. Um, I think we make two mistakes pretty commonly uh, when we roll out large programs. One, we get it so tailored to a particular population, let's say uh, director, VP, EVP. Um, and we think, oh, well, that's going to be great and apply to the rest of the organization. It doesn't consider the entire learning ecosystem. And it's almost like we go and teach another language to a small group of people in the organization, but we've forgotten to carry that language or the, the skill or the activity or the, the pace of it, whatever you might be um, discovering in that learning to the rest of the organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be equal intent, but how might you, if you have a, a large learning organizational initiative, how might you adapt it to um, the entire system so no one's left behind, right? And doesn't feel elitist or exclusive because, you know, change, um, some might be further down the change curve, they're onto the next thing and you've left a whole bunch of your organization in the dust. Then you have the opposite problem. Um, you peanut butter everything um, so that people uh, are like, oh, that doesn't feel any different than I did anywhere else. And thank you, I could have found that on my LinkedIn feed, I could have Googled it, that kind of thing. So um, the ROI to me is around, I guess, honestly change transformation and using that, that thinking in embedding your learning, uh, whatever that might look like. Uh, and that really challenge yourself to differentiate what is your learning doing? What is that, that learning conversation doing that could not be found on Google, on your LinkedIn feed, on a YouTube piece, right? Because we are, as humans, we are desiring learning all the time. So where could we get the biggest bang for our buck? You know, coming from a low cost airline, we wanted to be as efficient as possible with where we targeted learning in the organization. Obviously the primary would be skills and maintaining regulatory standards, et cetera. And then culturally, um, when we went to uh, do larger uh, programs, we really relied on the momentum of the culture to move things through so that we were giving people the right thing and validating them on that journey. Because again, you know, back to my change management reference, you can have a great idea, but if no one's following you and no one's using that tool, there's no ROI. So uh, and maybe to touch on the comment around inaction, well, you know, in the last two years, have you and your organization been active in developing people? Has that paid off? Are you seeing higher retention? You know, this talk about credentialing, that kind of thing, um, it matters to people. And if they don't get it, it's a way of saying uh, we don't value you or it could be interpreted that way. So it's important that, you know, I love what people are saying, have real human conversations about what people want so you can get value out of those investments, whether it's a quality of conversation or a formal designation, certification, that kind of thing. Um, be human um, and uh, connect to people. So will be amazed what ROI comes back from that. Yeah, those are great. Um, Shane and then Kathy. I saw, I saw Shane had his virtual hand up and then right. Kathy, I saw your real hand. So. Kathy, <laughs> Kathy's so analog. I love it, everything about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I was I was connecting what Amber was saying there too, uh, and something that I really love what what you said there was it ties to what somebody was asking in the Q and A was, you know, what about that practice of making it possible for employees to have time in their day to learn and develop? Because I think we collectively struggle constantly with the I had this plan to develop. So even if even if we get that good head end stuff where they have a good human conversation, they have that development plan in place, but they get to December, let's call it. And they're like, oh, good, that was fun. Let's just copy paste that to next year. And they do that year on year, right? 
because the progress, the meaningful progress is not the piece we're focused on. We're usually focused on you've got a development plan in place because we can measure the number of development plans in place and we congratulate ourselves on a job well done. And I think that that's where we as organizations need to be having human conversations with leaders and employees to say, like, we recognize that for you to truly be engaged here, like, we know that you want to get better at stuff. If we go back to the old model of autonomy, mastery, purpose, right, is people want to get a chance to decide how they do their work in a day. And this is the, the drive model from Daniel Pink, right? They want to know how, they want to be able to decide how they do their work, which we've gotten a little better at. I think we've, we've gotten out of the command and control to some degree in certain areas and certain jobs lend themselves to it more than others. But then that mastery piece, see, I want to know that I'm getting better at something. And so we need to make sure that we have that discussion around, um, you know, one of the expectations for leaders is to say, you know, how are you managing the work? How are you managing your team? to be able to allow for that time and how are individuals prioritizing it, uh, either in the way or what that they do their work or being able to have that human conversation back with their leader and say, hey, yeah, I could do all five of these things, but then I'm going to have to push the development part off my plate, which is what is happening today. How do we get it? So it's like, you know, know what, let's take this one off because it's actually lower priority, but let's prioritize the development piece. And that's an ongoing conversation that the organization has to have because if, Senior leadership is saying, I need these many widgets and those are literally not possible to get done in the period of time, resources, type, scale, people, whatever. The more with less has come home to roost then we need to shift out of that and say, well, we're gonna be doing more with even less because in the great, I read an article the other day that recast the great resignation is the great reprioritization for people about what matters to them and what are they gonna make their choices based on. And if you think it's a struggle today to produce that many widgets, with the people you have, imagine doing it with 20% less because they've all decided, you know what, I it actually matters more to me that I go and grow than that I stay and produce. Kathy, did you? Yeah, yeah, just a couple of things. So, so definitely what Shane was talking about um, kind of sparked my, my idea that you really need to have that learning culture at all levels. And then you're gonna get everyone in line in terms of, of trying to make the time for training, all of those things, right? Um, you know, it, it's it's difficult when you're there fighting fires all day, trying to get those widgets out. And then someone learning and development says to you, hey, you got a course, you got to spend six hours on this. What's, what's gonna be the priority, right? So um, it's just trying to get that learning culture, reprioritizing things like Shane mentioned as well. Um, I think that that's gonna be key. And then the other thing I was thinking about was um, in terms of like recruitment and selection and just uh, retention in general is making sure you have inclusive learning as well. And uh, so when I think about like e-learning, um, you know, you can have however many courses built and people are reading text or maybe just watching a video. You might, you might want to be throwing in audio into the, to, to the heavy text areas and doing all those types of things so it's easier for people. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Nikki, I see you're off mute. But you also said you were always off mute, and Paula, I'll let you. I, I want to know if you either of you want to weigh in on this. I do. I, I went on mute for a moment there. You just I, missed it. I right? <laughs> no, I, I I love what Shane's saying, and Kathy, you took some of my points there, which is awesome, and that's really around you know it's creating that culture. I call it a learning ecosystem or a learning organ. There's a bunch of different ways to describe it, but you know, we, we want to do this learning and, and Shane, what you said, you know, about like, how do you actually then bring those skills forward? So when we talk about ROE, it's one thing to put on formalized learning and it's say we had X number of people that registered, but we're not bringing it back to the organization in the right manner. And I think that's where LND struggles a lot is how do you actually measure this? I know it's something all the time I'm looking at, how are we measuring that return? Cause it's not about bums and seats, right? It's not about how many people registered. It's about what is the change in the organization? And I think one of the biggest gaps that I experience in, in everywhere that I've been is trying to allow um, people to actually leverage those skills and use those skills and bring them back to their team. So if you go to a formal course or you take a formal course, part of that should be that extending the finish line, so to speak, of where now you bring it back to your team if you're a leader or if you're an individual contributor, you share what you've learned and you are given the space to implement it, even if it goes sideways doesn't matter. Give it a go and develop it, right? And start to create 
that reward, to be honest. I mean, if I go, I went and did a three-day course on strategy and it was fantastic. And I was like, I'm ready. I'm going to apply this. And then I got so darn busy. I didn't have a chance to do any of it. And so I didn't have time to intentionally take that and give it a go. And I just feel like that would shift learning as a whole if we rewarded people for bringing it back or we made it actually part of their development plan and part of leadership accountability to get that return on our investment that you are responsible for and encourage your teams to bring this back, apply it, learn from it, figure out what works. And we just, we are just so darn busy that we don't do it. Yeah. But moving that, extending that finish line or moving that line to three, six, nine months out from when you've taken that course could have a significant impact uh, by just shifting something as small as that. For sure. Paula, I'm come, I'll come to you on this. And then Kathy, I'm going to come to you on the role of technology after this. So. I think the one thing I would add here is that we're all struggling with ROI. <laughs> this, is, this is the eternal struggle that every learning professional goes through. And this is, this is a dilemma. It's not a problem. A problem has a silver bullet solution. Uh, and this is a dilemma. And it's going to be unique to your own organization. And I think, you know, I myself am pulling lovely nuggets from all of the panelists here. And I think that, you know, even on the chat, there's some great insight as well. And you're going to, you know, you're going to have to find the right mix of these things to try in your, own, in your own organization. And what works here might not work in, you know, in another organization or, you know, in your next life or even in like our next, you know, whatever we have to pivot to or pirouette to. The pirouette has now become a new word, eh? I love it. Um, so then as we pivot or pirouette or start looking forward uh, even more, uh, it is clear and somebody talked about this earlier that you know we jumped on virtual learning, e-learning very early on. We've, we've really embraced technology in the past couple of years, right? So as we look forward, Kathy, or as you think about the last couple of years, let's talk, touch on this piece. What role is technology going to play going forward and how should companies think about that? Because just because it's available in some cool platform doesn't necessarily mean that's the right way to do it, right? Okay. So thoughts. It, exactly. Um, like someone had mentioned previously, we've essentially been forced into the way that we're doing things right now, right? So um, I, I'm a total tech geek, so I love all the te technology in terms of L&D or anything else. Um, so it, even though we were forced into it, I think that it, it, it is something that should stay um, that and I think it'll become definitely more prevalent um, as we go forward and that people are more comfortable using it just because we were forced to use it when when potentially before you didn't really have to have that need to do it just because you didn't really have to. Um, I think a lot of employees actually depending upon the type of training prefer in person and I think for some types of training it is the probably the right mechanism to use so I think it, it'll be a hybrid we're still going to end up doing in person they're still obviously going to be on the job training but in terms of uh, technology I think we're going to see a lot more of the virtual instructor led training um, it's going to reduce costs you're not going to have to fly people potentially across provinces to, to go get training um, more inclusive for individuals who can't travel as well. Um, and then, you know, the, the types of technology out there, and, and it was mentioned previously as well, you know, you, you've got your base LMS, that's going to be your compliance, that's, that's really L&D <clears throat> pushing courses out to, to employees. But then you've got like your, your learning experience platforms. So those are more like those ones that are now it's using more, you know, AI in it and, and algorithms and it's recommending things now. So I think there's a, and there's also hybrid options as well. So you've got an LMS that has components of the experience platforms. Uh, I know someone had mentioned in the chat talking about um, a good thing to do it like discussion boards. So when we're talking about, you know, going out and getting, uh, let's say formal training and bringing that back. It, you could use your LMS or use uh, whatever platform that you have to have some forums where people can bring back those learnings, whether it's, you know, leadership or, or whatever else. Um, AI, th there's, there's so many things going on with AI, AR, uh, VR, or um, artificial intelligence. I, I know that someone had mentioned about the uh, acronyms <laughs> to make sure that we, we say what they are. Yeah. So augmented reality, virtual reality, those types of things. Um, there's a lot of companies getting into that space now. And it was at some point 
very expensive to get into. I think it's still pretty expensive to get into, but the costs are going down. So, so just making sure that you have that technology in place. Um, if you've got multiple uh, locations, you got to make sure that that technology is available to every individual if you're going to be going more uh, a technology route, right? But yeah. there's definitely a lot of interesting things coming out of that space. Um, the the in artificial intelligence piece, I was reading an article just recently about uh, a lot of them use it for scenario planning or scenario practices. Um, and, and they have it to a point where the AI will, will um, look at your gestures of your face and then it'll grade you on how you came across. Pretty interesting stuff, right? So um, yeah, so I, I think that technology is here to stay. It's just gonna get better. Um, I think it's a, from an efficiency standpoint for, for learning and development, I think it's a great thing to, to have, um, you know, to, to look at the results and, and all those types of things for your organization and really figure out uh, metrics on, on when, for how things are working as well. Excellent. I think there's oh, okay Shane Shane and Sorry, then Kathy. Kathy I think one of the things that that you said there too is is that's the technologies that are often in the public conversation right they're the stuff that's kind of bright and shiny right now I think there's also a huge world that as we bring a bunch of these threads together and we think about how do I get the time for learning how do I make it recognized like there's all these different pieces we've kind of come to right and in some cases one of the focus pieces that is really present for me in the last little while is how are we using some not act, not that bright and shiny technologies, but using them for the right reasons and in the right ways. And one of the ones that comes to mind for me is how are we using pre-assessments when we're doing something like a virtual training or even assessing what do you need to go do from a learning perspective and honoring the fact that maybe you acquired this knowledge somewhere else. Maybe you do already know even something like, you know, the, the uh, annual safety training that just about every organization has to do and having safety as a forefront in our culture is super important. We need that. And we need to recognize that I might have done WIMIS at another organization. And so sitting through the WIMIS course for this organization may not be all that good use of my time. And you do that five or six times over and all of a sudden your annual training takes 10 hours. And that we, because we're not making the space, even for our mandatory stuff, people are doing that in their own time and they start to like that starts to get grading, right? And people start to dread that. But how are we doing it where if it is something where it's the assessment matters, like that's what I'm going to give you the check mark based on, if you will, or that's what I'm going to honor the learning based on. How am I doing more where I assess at the beginning? Can you pass it now? And if you can, go and, and, and be with, like go have a good time, right? Rather than that idea that I think is still in a lot of our minds and a lot of our colleagues' minds about, no, they'll only know it if they sit through our version of it. And I think that's really that idea. And I love what Paula said there about like the Netflix translation to the TikTok thing, to that idea of we're all learning it from various places. We're Googling it. Like if I can get the right answer, does it matter what I did to be able to get the right answer? And maybe in some cases it will, but I think for the vast majority of it doesn't. And we can be much more efficient with people's time and make learning less of a burden in that way. Yeah. 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 What's coming, yeah. What's coming up for me as I hear those comments is fit for purpose right? Let's not get distracted by the shiny things. And there's a place for the metaverse in learning develop. I don't know what that means just yet, but we're going to learn quickly. Um, and then I'll go back and, uh, and use my word before, humans. Um, when do we need to have a human to human learning experience? When is it self-directed? And I think this is a, maybe an error or um, a trap that learning development professionals fall into. Well, we really like this one tool and we go way deep on that one particular tool and we start to lose sight of the learner in the center of all of that. Um, and so how might we start um, user-centric, uh, learner-centric and build back so that it matches the organization's outcomes, right? How do, you know, back to that ROI conversation, um, we need to tie learning outcomes to business outcomes. Learning enables business outcomes. It's not this little side hobby. Mm -hmm. And again, if you want to get, um, you know, approval for dollars on investments for, for technology, you need a business case that you're going to, you know, minimize headcount, reduce travel, um, you know, as I think this is another thing that learning development professionals often forget is that we are running a business within the business and how can we use the language of the business um, uh, to state our case, right? Uh, so that's what's coming up for me as I hear those comments. Excellent. 
for yeah, me, sorry, ahead, I'm going to jump in. I think for me, what comes back to I'm and and I love all the the fabulous technology and whatnot. But the one thing that I find um, it doesn't take into mind maybe fully is inclusive learning. So if I think about inclusive design for learning, where we are making sure that whatever we are designing, whether it's a safety course, whether it's a simulation, whatever it is is it truly accessible to everybody? And so when we start to move into some of these higher technologies, we might have employees and we do have employees that are actually out in the field that maybe aren't on technology and we're near as much as the rest of us are, right? Or we even have, like that doesn't, location doesn't really matter. But I worry that sometimes we get, we jump on the bandwagon with these new shiny technologies. We spend the money because you know what, it looks fantastic. It's engaging, however, somebody with different diverse needs actually might not be able to engage with it because it's the visuals, whatever it is, or because maybe that technology is just, it's too foreign for them. It's not something that they're used to. And I just, we can build whatever we want, however we want, right? Even when we look at, are we going to do face-to-face? Is it going to be synchronous, asynchronous? We can come up with whatever we want, but it has to be the right fit with the right tools for the right audience. And it has to be inclusive. And I feel like sometimes when we get too far down that technology road, it is not inclusive for somebody that needs to use text-to-speech or needs to use their keyboard to mouse or all those other pieces. And it becomes exclusive learning and not inclusive learning. Yeah, really good point. Uh, Paula, do you want to you want to weigh in on this technology one too as a as a final thought, and then I'm going to perhaps change up uh, the next couple minutes to to get to some of the audience questions before we get to your each of your final thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, probably the tech professional should actually weigh in on the tech conversation. Um, but I would say that the thing that comes to mind for me, and I think what Nikki just said was really great. That you know, there's there's very shiny things, but if I can use the analogy of when I first learned to drive a car, if you gave me a Maserati, it probably wasn't going to go any better than if you gave me a tiny like beater, like that was a Civic, right? And so if my, you know, the only thing that really changes about the fundamentals is your attention to them. The fundamentals are always the fundamentals. Um, and our, our brains, you know, when Amber said about being human, like our brains haven't really changed dramatically in the last hundred thousands of years. So, you know, really designing, you know, if you don't have that giant budget, that's okay. You can still do some incredible learning with like the cheap and cheerful tech. There's amazing things you can do with Slack. There's amazing things you can do with Zoom. We're doing it right now. These are not like super expensive technologies. Um, There's also amazing things that you can do if you buy the Maserati. Um, But I think that, you know, be careful that you don't think the tool is going to fix the problem. Yeah. Okay, so I know we had a couple other thoughts that we wanted to touch on around learning formats and credentials, but we've got a good three dozen questions from the audience sitting here that I would love to get to some of them. I'm sure we've touched on some of them through the conversation. I know Jenny's been watching. So Jenny, I'm gonna kind of turn this to you to to pull some of these questions out to pose to our panel here and and we'll see where we can go. Maybe we'll try and shorten uh we won't necessarily go to everybody on all of them let's put it that way and then we can try and get through some of these okay thanks great the question really is where to start a common theme seems to be how can operational leaders give their people time to learn so it's very different sort of versions of this but people are very interested in we're busy we're short on numbers how do we make that time for learning it's not directed to anybody. So I'll let anyone who wants to start, start. Okay, you're gonna need, yeah, I'll, you're going to need an executive leader in that function to believe in your cause. So again, back to the business within the business, you need to establish that agreement because if it uh, is okay to not prioritize the training all the way up to the top layer of the organization, honestly, my answer would be good luck. Uh, And when you do have that um, advocate, uh, that person to say, this is adding value there, you could, you know, it could be as simple as you're allotted, you're scheduled a a certain amount of uh, time to complete that training, right? Because there is, you know, a cost to inaction, as we talked about before. So I think that you, you have to come in with like classic business tactics, get buy-in, add proof, and then um, have it endorsed by that area of the business. Otherwise, it's the learning team that made you do it, right? Versus your business area wanted to do it and saw value in it. 
Yeah. Thanks, Amber. Uh, uh, Paula, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah. Craig. That's no, okay. Yeah, we've we've tried a couple of things, and so I just throw these out as ideas. And I think um, you know, it's it's not a one size fits all, as Amber says. You know, you're going to have to get like each leader from each kind of team team or function, however you think about a business unit, to buy in. Um, our engineers have done a thing. We tried it with the entire company and it was wildly successful with engineering. It's called Pi Time, which is passion and innovation time. And so it's time for people to work on projects that have something to do with our moonshot and our moonshot, it would be our version of a, um, like a vision or mission statement. And so that's been wildly successful with, with the engineering team. You know, we have a, our client success. They did reading week. So they actually shot, shut down kind of, all the, you know, all our external client things. And it was a chance for people to not only do learning, but, you know, to catch up on some of that compliancy type learning, but also to just take some time off if they needed to rest. Um, you know, so I think uh, I know that Udemy does this thing. It's called uh, Deal. So it's, I think it's the last Friday of every month. It's I mean, the entire company. It stands for drop everything and learn. So the entire company just stops and does something around learning. So obviously they're a learning company, probably easier to get by in there on that. But I think just testing things out on the teams that you have that are excited about this and finding what might work. Um, and don't be afraid to fail, like test it out and test it out with a couple of different teams. You know, what works with one will, won't work with another. Yeah. Carry on, Jenny, what's next? <laughs> Thank you, there's a host of ideas in there for sure. Going back to another theme that we've heard a lot about during the, the past hour is on the job training. And a couple of questions have come in asking for, for you as panelists, how, how does your company recognize or reward or provide something for those mentors who do provide on the job training? Is, it, is that a dumb thing? So I can jump in. I wouldn't say that we necessarily formally recognize, and I think we need to better recognize on the job training. Um, but I knew, like, we've just launched um, a mentorship program. And how we position the mentorship program was it was on, it is basically to some degree on the job learning. You're learning different skills, different type, connecting with people outside of your own role. But that learning is, we actually ask them to make it part of their performance goals. So if you are a mentor or a mentee, that actually becomes part of your performance goals for that year and determining what do you want to get out of that. Um, and so, you know, are, what skills is you as a mentee? Are you looking to gain or knowledge as you're looking to gain? And it truly becomes, as Shane mentioned earlier, creating those development plans or those performance plans. And to me, that is key. Um, if I've got team members or any, organi any leader has team members that want to go and try something new on the job, pop it in there as part of your development plan so that at the end of the year, as your performance review or through your performance conversations, you are acknowledging and recognizing the time and effort you're putting in and your leader will do the same. And that can start to shift the culture a little bit by making it formalized. Um, and then there is a recognition for it. So that would be one of the recommendations I would put forward. I don't know what everyone else has to, to think on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in here. I, I agree with you, Nikki. Um, similarly to, at our company as well we don't do you know anything really formal for the for the leaders that are doing the on the job uh, training um, our, our team has created uh, or is in the process of creating learning paths for every position right now and part of that is a skills dashboard that we've created and uh, so within that skills dashboard the you know the, the learner obviously knows what they need to hit and then that that supervisor or, or the person that's doing the training also, runs through that and they utilize that through performance conversations and those types of things. So I, I completely agree that at the time when you're looking at that that person who's done the training for the new for the new employee or for an existing employee, that has to be part of that performance discussion. That they that they're they are a good coach, they're they're a good mentor, they they've been training and that is it's a piece of their you know speciality, right? So I agree with that. Um, I see a question here from Jordy, and uh, Jordy, we will definitely have some uh, pieces for the audience to walk away with. We're going to leave some time here at the end for each of our panelists to provide their thoughts on, you know, what we need to be thinking about for the future of learning and some questions that you can take back and ask your own organization. So we'll definitely get to that. Uh, Jenny, what's, what do you, what did you flag next? Okay, here's another one that's come up from Edward Newman. <clears throat> Which members of the discussion panel are familiar with the concept of micro-credentials? Uh, offers an open invitation, but I think if we just 
offer the question is, what are your thoughts on micro credentials and within your organization compared to what you're seeing outside of your organization? Well, I think, um, I think they are an, a wonderful answer to some of what we've talked about in terms of how do you recognize, how do you have something that has that weight that's more than just being able to say, oh yeah, you know, I learned from this. Um, I saw in the chat some stuff about like learning from mistakes, like the, the school of hard knocks, you know, degree that we've all gotten at various points. And I think that's a, that's a key part of it as well is, so micro-credentials fill this kind of gap in between the recognized from outside to something that is programmatically recognized inside, right? So that helps because that gives it that, just that little extra level of, if you don't trust that I said it, well, I've got the thing from it, right? Where I think we need to keep shifting is these conversations and it, it builds on what we talked about earlier about just having that human conversation, right, Amber? Is um, that we also need uh, to help people get better at honoring and recognizing when they have actually developed. Because we've talked a lot about sometimes you have to put the big flashing bright neon marquee sign in bright pink pointing to the thing that said this was a development opportunity you had or this is a development opportunity for you. Uh, because a lot of times people just think, well, that was just more work I was asked to do without either having the conversation that makes that explicit. So that dialogue between leader or person who's engaging them or mentor or whatever it is, um, because all of this stuff is fine. But if individuals aren't valuing it or credentialing themselves from doing whatever it is that they've done to develop, it's never going to hold the weight. And so that's why it's all these different tactics. And so you don't, I think, have to do everything. But development plans help because there's something written down that somebody can point out and say, but you did this thing. Like, look, you did a thing, right? Or having those conversations where leaders are, are skilled to be able to say, I want to recognize that you did this thing. It's important. I want to make it visible that you did that. And I'm gonna, in essence, credential you through our conversation, right? Micro-credentials mm -hmm. as a kind of program element provide that. So there's all these different ways to approach it. But fundamentally, it comes down to how are we creating the notion within our environment of that there is value in doing this thing, that there is visibility to the individual themselves that this was a thing that met this need um, or this requirement. Uh, and then how do we keep perpetuating that? Because that's how you build that kind of learning culture and I liked what Amber said earlier about, and how do we do that in the language of the business? Sorry. Because that's what's important to them, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, somebody mentioned earlier about AI picking up on facial expressions. So I've been very cognizant and watching the screen here. Paula, I saw you nodding along to a lot of what Shane was saying. Amber, I saw it was either a stretch or maybe potential disagreement with something. So I'm going to go to Paula and then Amber on, on, on that. Yeah, I think I think micro credentials is, is is just another version of gamification. And you know, when you when you look at a lot of um, a lot of you know technologies, they use gamification to kind of you know bring people back in and keep people kind of in the platform and things like that. So I think anything where uh, you can gamify it, it's you know it kind of speaks to us as humans. We we like to compete whether it's within ourselves, within you know um, with that, with each other or other people, you know that type of thing. I think bonus points if you can even get it to be something that's valuable beyond your organization. But I think that within your organization is just as valuable. So, you know, to, to Shane's point, it's like where they can value it, you know, and they would be, you know, well, like a lot of your people, then I think that you're on to something. Maybe I was stretching or keeping my eyes on the very vibrant chat. I love what's going on there as yeah, well. Um, the micro credentialing, I, I'm going back, I think I was eight years old, getting my brownie badge really meant a lot, right? And uh, so how do we fill up our sleeve? How do we fill up our pinafore? I think I'm using words I haven't used for 30 years, but um, so, so those are in, important things. Um, I think though that there's, I, as an organizational leader who would need to invest in that, I think that we are going to reinvent a wheel that's actually being done really well. Um, I love seeing people um, complete their LinkedIn learning course or that kind of thing. That's a micro credential. So I think what the gap is, is um, organizations aren't leveraging what's right out there and how might we pull that back in and say, thank you experts who are, are in the business of building this. I don't want to have to build it at home. I think we're sort of um, organizations, I see them struggle 
between do we just build it in-house and maybe touching on a conversation we were addressing before or do we just grab it from the market because it's pretty universal um, so again uh, brownie badges they matter how do we get them to the people yeah. and, and Shane, Shane's recognized that you must have done well on your life-saving badge as you've saved his more than he can count so that's fantastic um, Nikki or Kathy, do you want to, this is an interesting topic. I've seen lots of conversation here. Do either you want to weigh in on micro-credentials or? Yeah, I'd love to if I could quickly. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Yeah, um, I love I love the the relations there to the brownie badge. I was a brownie too, and I remember like how much that meant. But if you relate that back to the workforce, it's also got to mean something to the leader, um, right? And so to so to the organization. And I think that's sometimes where our gap is. You can you can leverage LinkedIn Learning within your organization. Lots of great micro credentials. The novelty of that does wear off after a while and so you've got to make sure that whatever you're implementing in regards to that is really done purposefully and intentionally and that the organization is promoting it as well there has to be something intrinsic learning is you know your own accountability your development is yours as a, as a human being but if you're going to be putting that time and effort in it needs to be built and bought into by the organization. And I think sometimes we use that micro-credentials or pop on, do a couple of things. It's great. You've got your stamp on LinkedIn, this and the other. But how do we, we need to shift the organization to actually recognize and appreciate and value that. And that comes back to them. What are you teaching back to your groups and so forth? So I think we've said, if there's so many different like things we can do, somebody just, but you know, great buzzwords, there's all sorts of things we can, you know, implement. But do we really have a learning organization and I think that's where the core is. It's actually going to value and understand what it is we're doing as we bring in all sorts of different modalities and, and ways of teaching and learning. I feel like there's still a gap there. there you go. Kathy, final thought to you on this one. And then we've got one more question from the audience that we'll get to. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Nikki, there. I think, I think we can have all this open training like LinkedIn Learning or whatever, you know, other platforms like that, but it really has to be something that, um, you know, it really works on the employees like human skills development or soft skills, right? Um, and and really needs to be something that comes back to the organization. Like it has to mean something to the company. There has to be some value to the company. Otherwise, you know, why why are they really giving it, right? So so working internally on the human skills, having broad range of those, I think is very important because everybody has different needs um, and things that they want to develop. But in terms of, you know, those items like, you know, their technical skills or, or things like that, then we need to make sure that that's something that is really kind of pinpointed on the organization and what we want to increase skills in. Excellent. And really interesting that the chat on this topic has been uh, pretty amazing. So uh, Jenny, what's our, our final question here? And then we'll close with that one. And then we'll get to each of you for your final thoughts and the question that you want to leave the audience with. I think this one sums up, <clears throat> doesn't sum up, takes us on from the last conversation came from Vincent Masterson. What would be your top recommendation for how an organization can foster a culture for learning? <clears throat> Excuse me. And asked if there were any specific leadership recommendations within that. So recommendations for how organizations can foster that culture of learning. I can Kathy's, start Kathy's off mute first. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, Amber had actually brought something up like this, talking about how you need to really have that that champion at the at the higher level. You you absolutely need to have that because if you're if you're going to be pushing things to uh, you know frontline employees or, or mid management, and they're getting pushed from the top for all their operational metrics or objectives. The, you're, you're not going to win. Like they need to be able to at the high level say, yeah, learning is important. And, you know, we will make sure that you have the time to, to do these things. Otherwise we're, you know, it's, you're not going to be able to uh, get any of the traction that you want on the lower level there. Perfect. Amber? Um, yeah, I'll add, I, I found a quote um, that uh, and it's been uh, dog-eared in my notebook, but if you want to lead, you need to grow. Good leaders are always good learners. Classic from uh, John C. Maxwell. Uh, one of the things we did with, uh, I think what I'd consider a wild, wildly successful program at WestJet, we called it I Lead, Initial Leadership, 
we had everyone from a contact center team lead to the CEO participate in that class. It was, a, it was old school, formal learning, uh, physical presence, but we had the pre, the post. We really uh, leaned into the structure of what was ultimately the behavior change we were looking for as far as more engagement. Uh, but one of the, the nuggets in it was leader as teacher. You know, it go, goes back to what Kathy touched on from my previous comment. We had that level of endorsement. The top down, you saw, you know, Ed Sims, our former CEO, in the classroom with you, learning a skill at the same time as you, um, and, and a willingness to have the humility to learn in, in that environment. And so, you know, did we luck out and we had a leader who was willing to, to um, demonstrate that level of vulnerability and dive in? Um, or was it our, our culture? There's so many. Um, uh, fundamentals that were there, but the the intent behind it was a desire that we could be better if we worked together and and went through the journey. I, I think we overthink what training can do or should do. Um, I think you should pick one thing every year that you want to move the needle on and put all your horsepower on that. You know, do we want to get better at handling crisis? Well, two years taught us how to do that. Now let's return to strategy um, because we already have that skill built up. So you know, again, good leaders are always going to be good learners. So how can you get them out front being the face of those programs? Yeah. Excellent. Shane, I think, Nikki, Paula? Yeah, I think, I think that there's a piece there too about it's not even just, because um, I think we all at various points in organizations will struggle with, maybe you've got leaders that, that buy into that, maybe you don't. But it's also looking at what are all the things and the parts of the conversation that are important to that business at the time. Ours right now, unsurprising, like so many people, is very much centered around recruitment and retention. How are we getting enough talent? We're growing like crazy. How are we getting enough talent to deliver on our projects? And how are we keeping that talent that we have? And I think when you can put it and, and found it in those principles and look at things that you've made, either commitments to your board or the public conversation you're having, that gives you a foundation to say, okay, are we, are we a company that puts our money where our mouth is? And that money is not necessarily just cash, that's time, that's effort, that's all those things that um, we want our leaders and our individuals in the organization to prioritize or to make time for, or whatever you wanna call it. Like, I think some of it is, sure, if you don't have this one person that's, that's your real champion at that level, I think you, find all the things that you have heard or seen about the organization and you echo, you mirror it back and say, okay, let me just confirm here. Like, this is what we're saying. These are some things, cause we, you know, collectively amongst all of the people that are in this chat, we probably have 950 studies and metrics and papers we can point to that, that say how learning or learning culture, cause even that can be a really scary word for some executives. Like what does learning culture mean? That sounds like it takes me away from doing the things, right? Um, and so that integrating all of this idea of learning, I think we've kind of circled around it. How do we take all of that um, learning that we're talking about and have it not be, I have to take you out of doing the work, right? We talked about on the job training, but even that sometimes implies this kind of pullback, right? How are we thinking about it as the initial pieces or the, the integrated pieces that happen during somebody's experience with us, right? And their, their whole journey or their whole career. I think that it's that too. It's if you don't have this person at the at the top levels of the organization that's on side with this yet, it doesn't mean you're down and out. It means you've got to kind of do a lot more work and try to champion that. And that becomes the job, not making the learning, but creating the environment within which the learning can foster. Yeah, that that's fantastic. Uh, Nikki, I know you wanted to jump in on that, but in the interest of time, because I do want to make sure we hit a, a, a really sharp 1029 finish here, uh, we'd ask you all to kind of come with a thought around, you know, looking to the future, right? What are the biggest challenges you see going forward and how are you thinking about addressing them and what's a question you would leave with the audience, all right? So Nikki, maybe I will start with you on this is just kind of your final thoughts about the future of corporate learning and a question you can pose to folks or folks can take back. Uh, lots, lots of thoughts on the future of learning. I think, you know, corporate learning, we're always going to have some of the same challenges. I don't think those are going to change our ROI, our creating that, you know, learning ecosystem or, or um, you know, organization within our organizations. But I think, you know, moving forward, I think we have learned 
that we can do just about anything in the last two years. Um, and using Jocelyn had a note in there, you know, never mind pivot, let's move to adapt. And we've adapted. And we're going to continue to adapt because our next shift now is this hybrid model, right? Where some people, organizations have changed how their employees are going to work. So, you know, some companies might go fully back to the office. Some companies might be that flex, that hybrid. And so we have to learn how to continue to adapt to what corporate learning is going to look like. And I think we need to also reflect back on our lessons learned of everything that we have delivered in the last two years. Because we've learned that we've got it, you know, we have shifted and companies like third party vendors that I've worked with adapted so fast and built these great programs online. And so now we need to look and go, okay, how do we want to continue moving forward? You know, was this the right way? Just because we can deliver leadership development online does not necessarily mean it's the right way to do it. How do we create that, that, you know, blended approach. And I think honestly, getting feedback from our employees, because as learning professionals, we can say at best practice is X, Y, Z, we're going to deliver e-learning this, that, or the other, but the last two years, people are tired of being on camera. People are tired of being online 12 hours a day. And so really easy for us to continue to do some, but maybe we need to look at doing things a little bit differently and have those conversations with our employees and our organization and understand, you know, what worked well, even better if, and then what do we want to move forward in? And I just, I just think we need to take a breath uh, before plowing forward with our own intentions and our own ideas. And let's just breathe and just see, you know, how's everyone doing? How, what, what did you enjoy about learning this year and what didn't you? Um, and I think too, if I was to do a needs assessment on an organization's learning needs, they're very different today than they were six months ago, um, two years ago, because we're shifting, we're adapting continuously. So don't pigeonhole, pigeonhole yourself into one way of doing things based on the type of course, um, just really go in with open eyes. And then the question or the thing I would pose to everyone to consider when you're looking at developing your employee uh, and leader programs and employee and leader development. Um, and this can even tie in a little bit of just the conversation we had about how do you kind of create, like how do you get the buy-in and whatnot is don't look short-term. I mean, we tend to reactively say, this is what we're going to deliver this year. This is going to be great for employees, or here's our one-year leader. And we're targeting people in their current state. But think about, you know, your entire succession planning, your entire employee's career from hire to retire. Those people that just joined your organization, are they high potentials? What do you want them? What groundwork do you want to start laying in your employee development that they will continue to grow on and help in the organization? Like Shane said, you don't have to have it from the top down, but if you can hit that from the ground running and start to develop that culture, it will change your learning within your organization because you're creating champions, but you're also building out what your future can look like uh, by building your leaders from day one and building those leadership skills moving forward. Oh, that's a great question. I love that. Uh, Amber, I'm going to come to you next for your closing thoughts and your question. For sure. Yeah. Um, I read this. I can't say I, I'm, I'm taking claim to it, but if you take the word reactive, jumble up those letters, you shift to creative, right? So how do we leave the reactive behind and focus on the creative? Maybe I made it up. Maybe I noticed it. Um, maybe it was not the author's intent. But I, I think that that's where we need to operate from right now. Uh, and I, again, what as I was sharing before, we overthink what L&D can do, um, what leaders should be able to do. Pick your one thing and, and lean into it with all you've got organizationally. I, I look back to one of the things we focused on at WestJet last year. We talked about psychological safety in a way we had never had before. Um, we came at it from multiple angles. We did not have a formal training program at it, but it was something that significantly shifted um, when we went to do our leader effectiveness survey because we talked about it in um, at, at every angle. And so um, because all of those things um, that we're trying to achieve organizationally, the business metrics, the customer impact, our NPS, all of that will be better when we are better humans. So my inquiry to everyone on the panel is how might you and your teams build more human capabilities in your organization, empathy, psychological safety, in conjunction with those business objectives? They're, they're riding underneath. Um, those um, superhuman skills that we often call soft. They're anything but. Uh, and so how might you put focus in that so that the business can travel along more effectively um, because you have higher trust, you've got better engagement, you've got better um, buy-in across the org. That's how I think you will make an impact. 
Fantastic. And that human aspect, I love it. And actually, there's a great comment in the, the chat here from Colin. I think that kind of plays into that. You know, the future of learning is about finding the right approach to support the right behaviors that contribute to the right results for our organizations. Right. And how do you do that without having people at the center of that? Um, Paula, and you next. Uh, first of all, I just want to say the human capabilities. I love that. I think I've heard of it as power skills, um, but I love human capabilities. It's so good, Amber. I would say um, I struggle with the future of learning because the future implies that somehow we're going to end up at an end state and that's like the end of the journey. And so I think um, this might sound a little bit morbid. Somebody once said this to me and it really helped with like my kind of time management, but it's like someday, someday you're going to die and you're going to leave a to-do list. And uh, I won't be quite so morbid with our careers, but at some point we're going to retire and learning is still going to be an industry. It's still going to be happening in the organization we're in. Um, you know, it's, it's still going to be going on and on. And so I think that um, it is a journey. And I think as such, um, it's kind of like, what's the next steps? And also don't forget to look back at the things that you've been successful at. You know, look at the things that you, you successfully nav navigated the last two years. You know, your organization did, your learners did, you did. Um, you know, you successfully navigated previous parts of your career. So like, I think having those moments is really important. Um, the other thing that I, I would throw out there is in this era of the great resignation, it does mean that we're having also the great onboarding, right? So there is a lot of people that are joining all of our organizations and wow, you can tip a culture with like a lot of those new folks. So how can you embed cult like learning into the way that they already, like, you know, they already think about your culture. So I think, you know, taking advantage of that great onboarding versus like ruminating on the great resignation. Um, but the question I have for you is uh, we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And so looking at your things and like, what must you do? What should you do? And what could you do? And that must is the things, you know, none of us are running with, with you know, really high, huge teams, you know, doesn't matter the size of your organization, every learning or every learning team is, is small compared to their organization. And so while you might be looking at some of us here on the panel and be like, oh, be like you have a team of whatever, or you have people around the world, or you have all this fancy technology, every learning team is running with less than it actually needs. And so, you know, it's getting really ruthless and like, what is a must, should and could, and then being able to go to the organization, it's like, hey, I know that you want me to do all of this stuff, but this is what I must do because this is all that my team can do and do effectively. Is it the right stuff? And to Nikki's point, getting feedback from your people, not just from your executives. And I, uh, when, when did priority become priorities, right? So how do you, how do, you do the one thing that's so, so important? I love that. Um, Kathy, and then we'll close with Shane. All right. Yeah. So uh, my thought was, <laughs> I, I think about L&D groups and, and typically we're a pretty creative, innovative group. And when, when I was talking about technology, there's all this like shiny technology we were talking about. And we might want to we might want to absolutely implement this in the organization. But what we really need to think about is, do we have the right learning foundation first? Like, do we have the people buy in like we talked about? How is the culture for learning? Do we have systems for individuals to be able to uh, support this uh, initiative that we want to do? Do we have the time and the resources? Um, so just making sure that the business uh, buys in, can make the time uh, available to their people to partake in, in the L&D programs. Um, I think that that's very critical to make sure that we can drive further initiatives and, and innovate the department. Um, so, so the question I, I kind of leave with everybody is, can your actual business support the L&D initiatives that you're looking to drive? So making sure that, like I spoke about previously, those kind of that like needs analysis from, from, the, um, to, from the ground level up. Do they have what they need to be able to support what you want to do? So looking at that. It's a great question. Love it. And then Shane, certainly not last not least, but to the gentleman with the coffee mug that matches his shirt, well done. Right. Well, you know, uh, when you're gonna be on camera, you gotta you know, plan to do things. Uh, as a side note, going last after this group of people is not only incredibly intimidating, but really hard just try to go, okay, I thought I was gonna talk about that. I'm not gonna talk about that, because that's what makes it, okay, this hard thing. Um, I, I think I'm gonna go off, off piste a little bit because uh, something too that came up in this conversation and, and then Tom in the chat talked about action bias from learning teams. And I think we often get to that place of we got to do all these things because we put our strategies together and our 
executives or, or business leaders come to us and say, hey, here's all the things that I, I'm going to need from you this year, right? And, you know, Kathy just talked about, do we have the foundation? I think that's a really important thing to think about. Amber talked about, do we have the human side of it, right? We talked about technology. We talked about recognizing where people come from uh, and where we are now in that kind of TikTok um, consumption mode and curation and Googling. Like, we, I think we've covered a lot of these things. What it caused me to think about is, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of not only learning le uh, leading learning teams, but also leading HR business partner teams and kind of HR proper. What I find really interesting about as I uh, re reflecting on this conversation is how are we partnering with our other people internally that also think about the employee experience to make sure we've got a really holistic view as to what is a person, and I'll just use kind of the, the example or person, What's their experience of their coming to work and working with us and this being a part of their job? And what it, what it causes to occur for me is we've talked a lot lately about, you know, people are making choices because of this great reprioritization resignation. We've got onboarding and so people are making decisions about did I make the right choice to come here? We've got all these pieces coming together. And it comes back to a central tenant that I really love, which is work is a part of life. There is no such thing as work-life balance, right? And so as we think about all these things and we keep asking for more things from people as this component of their life, how do we think about it? How do we come to our work saying, okay, all of us that, that think about this employee experience, how are we all getting around this table to have this conversation? How are you getting other folks that aren't L&D folks into this conversation about how this works? Because I think, you know, I loved that earlier on somebody said like, hey, define these acronyms because we don't all know them. Well, that's true all the time about people, whether it's acronyms or approaches or inclusive learning, like all these things we've talked about, I would say, how are you bringing people to the table when you think about the, the future of learning in your organization, whether it's culturally or programmatically or whatever it is, how are you bringing more of those minds together to figure out what these solutions are going to look like for your organization? Because they won't be exactly like any of these other examples that we've talked about. It will have to be bespoke for you and, and where your organization is. So get those people around the table and then get them really excited about creating that fantastic experience for people. And I think you can't lose. That is excellent. Um, so thank you all. Um, Shane, you talk about being, you know, feeling intimidated following this group. I'm an extremely humbled to be uh, sitting here today with each of you. Uh, your generosity for committing your time to this. I can't express my appreciation enough. So thank each and every one of you for that. It's been a fantastic discussion. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Uh, and folks, thank you for your participation in the chat and the questions to the questions we couldn't get to. We'll try and figure out how we get some answers to you. Um, I might be able to draw on the generosity of this group to provide their thoughts and uh, some writing to me. But uh, with that, have a great day. Jenny, thank you for your great support behind the scenes here. And uh, Nikki, Kathy, Amber, Shane, and Paula, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody.